Hey everyone, welcome to another Technovation Challenge video. My name is Tyler and I'm really excited to be back presenting for another year with Technovation. This is my fifth year presenting with Technovation, but it's the first time I've pre presented in the UK. Uh, and it's also the first time that I present it using a video. So it's gonna be a little different than usual because I'm normally used to hearing you and seeing you and hearing your questions as I present. So I'm gonna try to do a little bit of extra examples in Thunkable today to make sure you really understand the concepts. Uh, today's presentation is about databases and APIs. So we're gonna talk about how your apps can communicate with the cloud, how you can store things on your device, uh, and many other things. Uh, but before we jump into that, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I am in Ottawa, Canada, and I work for Shopify, and I work on the media team at Shopify. So what I do on the media team is I help merchants upload videos, images, 3D models to their stores, and also help provide experiences where they can view 3D models in their living room or in their cars, kind of like you see in the video here. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, and now I want to jump into some recall. I want to talk about some things we've already learned. So maybe you have to go back into your brain a little bit, think about a previous video, uh, and think about these couple things. So the first thing I want to talk about is event handlers. And then I also want to talk about variables. Uh, and if you want to take a moment and pause the video here, feel free to do that while you either go back and look at your previous presentation or also just take a moment to think about these things and we'll be here right when you get back. So the first thing is event handlers and event handlers are used to capture an action in our application. Uh, it could be when a user clicks a button, scrolls on the screen, rotates their phone to a different orientation. All of these are events that can then tell our application what algorithm or what piece of code to run. Um, a good example of this is in real life. Whenever we hear a fire alarm, we know to get up and leave the house immediately. Uh, the event that in that case is the fire alarm. And by capturing that event in our mind, we can trigger our own internal algorithm to say, oh, well, we have to escape. Do we go down the stairs? Is there a fire down the stairs? There's a bunch of events happening. So that's kind of the way I like to think of it. Um, one example I have here in Thunkable is my cute little dog of when I press that click me button, it changes the background of my screen. So I want to show you how that works in Thunkable here now. Okay, here we are in Thunkable, and you can see that I have a really basic UI here. The first thing that I have, as you see on the left side of the screen, is the screen one, and then all, the only other thing I have is this button, and this button says, click me. Uh, and if we go take a look at the blocks, it's also a very simple, U or simple uh, code. Uh, we have this yellow event handler, which is when button one is clicked, do something and in this case the do something is to set screen one background picture to a particular url and if you go look up that url it is going to be the url for that cute bernie's mountain dog so if i go back to the design page now and i click preview you'll be able to see my app and when i click the button the event is handled and it shows the dog so that's the example here i'm going to go jump back to the presentation here now and here is that Thunkable link for that project. You can go and take a look and see how it's done yourself. You can copy the project. And throughout the day, I'm gonna share these links for every example I do in Thunkable. So the next thing I wanna talk about from our recall is variables. So variables are very important building blocks of any application. They provide us a place to store a piece of data in memory. It could be numbers, it could be words or sentences, sometimes known as strings. You'll hear that word thrown around every now and then. It could be lists, it could be pretty much any data type that we store in a variable. And the way I like to think of them is they're little boxes that we place things in that can be used later in our application. So in real life, we do this all the time. When we meet someone new and they tell us their name, we take a moment to place that name somewhere in our memories. So the next time we meet them, we can recall that name and we can use that name to call them. Um, in our apps, we might store data that the user has entered, like their age, their name, their birthday, or we may use it to store the score of a soccer game. 
So you can see that I've sort of done this in a video. I have one team score here incrementing every time click me is pre pressed. And I'm going to jump over to Thunkable again here now, and we're going to take a look at this example. So here is my Thunkable example. Oh, it looks like I'm still stuck in edit mode here. So I'm just going to switch back from edit mode and we're going to take a look at the UX first. So you can see that this is also a very basic UX. I have a label, I have a button and I have the screen and over in the blocks tab. It's also pretty simple. I want to start by pointing out this first thing I do. So I initialize an app variable called score and I set that variable to zero. So that is the first thing that happens in this app. The next thing that you see here is another event handler. So when a button is clicked, it is running a certain algorithm. So the first thing that in that algorithm is to change the app variable score by one. So what's going to happen here is when the button is clicked, it's going to increment score to one, or if it's pressed again, it goes to two or three. And then the next thing that happens in my algorithm is it's setting the text of my label to be the app's score. So those are uh, variables and how we can use variables. And one thing I'd like to note here too is the order is really important. If I were to put this above changing the score, it would actually mean that we set the text of the label before changing the score. So the label will actually have the old score and when you press it again, it will get the new score uh, the second time around. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And I just want to show you how this looks in the design. So if I go to preview and I say, click me, you can see how this one works. So I'm going to jump back to Thunkable or to the presentation again, and you're, you're going to see the uh, Thunkable link here. So let's go to the next slide. And there's the Thunkable link for variables. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, which maybe you've touched on a little bit before, but I want to go a little deeper are the types of variables you can have in Thunkable. So in a previous presentation, you learned all about variables. We just recalled that variables are a place where an app can store data to be used later. One thing we didn't touch on is the types of variables that Thunkable use. So there are three types. It's app variables, stored variables and cloud variables and app variables are variables that only last while the user has the app open. And you might have seen that in the previous example. Every time I open the app, it reset to zero. Uh, so this means when a user exits an app, the information that they stored in a variable will be lost. Uh, so sometimes we want to persist data. So if someone was to tell us their name, we don't want to have to have them tell us their name every time they open the app. So what we can use for that is a stored variable. So let's say that the high score of a username, we can save that and it gets saved on their device as opposed to being saved in the app alone. The final type of Funkable variable is a cloud variable. And these are very similar to stored variables in that they can be used to get data back after the app has been closed. The one difference is that the cloud variables actually get stored in the user's like iCloud or on Android, it'd be like Google Drive. So they store the information externally. So if someone was to lose their phone, they would still be able to download the app again and get all of the previous variables and data back. The next thing I want to talk about here are key value stores. And this is probably a little bit of a new topic. Uh, key value stores are kind of like va variables. Sometimes we want to store data to be accessed later. And a common term for this in uh, programming is dictionaries or hash map. I like the idea of it being like a dictionary. We all know how to use a dictionary. When we need to find out the definition of a word, we can look it up by the word itself. And in this example, the word is the key that we use to unlock getting the definition back from the dictionary. Key value stores are very powerful because they can store lots of data but they take up a very small footprint in your, in your code. And like variables, you can still name the data you are storing with a key, and you can also get that, ver or that data back using a key. So there are a couple ways that Thunkable can do this, and one is local storage. 
Uh, and I just wanted to point out, if you look at the image here, let's say I needed someone's first name, last name, birthday, city, postal code, address. That's a lot of variables I have to initialize in my app and it could make the code look very messy. So one way we can clean this up is using local storage and local storage is creates a one piece where you grab things by the key and it will return it with the value. It uses this key value pattern. So I'm going to show you a quick example of this. And you can see here that it already says my name is Tyler and I type in a new name, Sarah, I update the name, then I leave the app and I come back and the name is still Sarah. So it's using that key value pattern to store that. And I want to jump over to Thunkable to show you how this works again. So this is my local storage example. Again, it's a very simple UX. I have a name label, which is that first thing there. I have a name input and I have an update name button. Now the blocks for this one are a little more complicated. So there's two things that I have to do here. I have to use the event handler to set the name when the page first loads. So if we go back to the design and you see preview, it already has my name here. It says my name is Tyler. And that's because when the screen loads, it gets that name out of local storage. And I want to show you that over here. So when the screen opens, it runs some code and that code that it's running, it's, it's saying local storage, get, get something by the key name. So I've decided that that key is name and this is the value and I can set the name label text to be the value. And I've also joined it with your name. So it shows up on the screen. The other side of this problem is I want to be able to update the name. So I have a text input here and I have an update name button. So if we go back to the blocks, we can take a look at the update name button event handler. And it says when the update name button is clicked, we're calling local storage, but instead of getting something like we were doing above, we're actually saving this thing and we're saving it with the key name and the value is the name's input text. So it's that text box on the design over here. So it's taking the value from that and putting it into local storage. Then once it is saved, it is updating the name labels text to be that value again. So that's kind of how this would work in local storage. And I'm gonna jump back to the presentation again here now, and you will see the Thunkable link. So that's the Thunkable link for this example. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about are databases. Another way we can store data is in a database. Sometimes when we hear the word database, we think it's gonna be a very complicated thing but it's actually very simple. A database is a table and we all have used tables. If you use Google Sheets or Microsoft Excel or even created a table in math class, then you've basically used a database. Databases allow us to organize information into rows and columns, just like a table. It could be a table of contacts of all of our friends, a list of products, a list of videos. It could be anything. The only thing that's distinct about databases is that it allows you to get data from a particular row of the table without having to check every single row. With databases, we can get a specific record by the ID of the row. So if we take a look at that picture there, I have a list of books and every row has an ID next to it or it has the row number. And that's how we can get things out of a database. So what I want to challenge you to do here now is to create an app to store a list of books. And then when you click on a, a book, it shows you the name, title, or the title, author, and the year it was made. And I also want you to be able to try to add a new book. So you can see this in the little video example here. And I think this would be a good time to pause the video and give this a go in uh, Thunkable. And when you come back, I'll be here and I'll walk you through how to do this in Thunkable. So I've jumped over to Thunkable here now, 
And now my UX looks a little more complicated and I've actually even hidden some things that we're going to take a look at afterwards. So it starts with a home screen and that home screen has a giant column in it. And it has a home title and it has a book list. And the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to actually create the database. So what I'm going to do is I already searched for the component and it's what I'm, this is considered an invisible component. So I'm going to drag it over and add it to my invisible components list. And now you can see I have a local DB down here and I'm going to do a couple things. First of all, I'm going to call it books. Um, because I think, and maybe books DB, because that makes it, it's a very clear name to me. So this is a book database and I'm going to edit the table first. So what I'm going to do, you can see that it has a couple columns, but these are not the columns that I want. So I'm going to delete that column and I'll start by renaming this one and it's going to be title. And the, another column that I'm going to need here is an author. And the final column I need is year. And it would be really helpful too if I already had some books in this database. So what I'm going to do here now is I copy, I'm going to copy and paste some books that I prepared before into my table. So you can see there is the three books that I've already added. Uh, and now I want to actually make it. So if I go to preview here now, nothing really happens because I just have my books and there, I haven't connected it to the database yet. So I have to start by going over to the blocks tab. And in this blocks tab, we can see it is empty. Um, and I want to start by saying, okay, I need to load the books into the database, but I need to do that based on an event. So I guess the event for this one is when the screen opens. So you can see I have this thing called home and I'm going to say when home, I'm going to use home starts because I think that's a more appropriate. So when home starts, I need to do something. And that thing that I want to do is set the books list to be something. So let's take a look. I have my component called book list here, and I'm going to say set book list text items to something. And now I need to set that to something from the database. So I'm, what I'm going to do next here is I'm going to open up my books database. And in this case, I only want to get a particular column. I want to just show the titles. So what I can do here is I can say call, get column, and I can drop that in here. And now I can just say the name of the column I want, and this is title. So hopefully now when I go over to my design and I run it, the book titles will show up in my list. So let's take a look and there is the book. So that's pretty cool. I have that first thing done. So the next, part of the challenge is showing the book. So when I click on any one of these things, I want it to be able to show the book. And to do that, I already cheated a little bit and I created a show book screen. So if we go over here on my show book screen, I have a column that says, has a label for title, a label for author and a label for year. And it also has a back button. So I can go back to the previous page. So. I think the first thing we can do here is we can add the action to go from one page to the other. So inside of my blocks page again, I'm going to take the book list and I'm going to say when book list item clicked, it's going to do something. And what is it going to do? It, it's going to navigate to my show page. So I'm going to drop navigate and I'm going to switch that to show book. And then I'm going to go back and give this a go. So let's take a look. Now, when I click on a book, oh, it goes to that page and you can see title, uh, author and year, but oh, and back seems to work as well. So let's take a look. Let's go over to blocks. I must have left some old code here. Ah, I did. So you can see I already put in back click and you can see that that navigates to home. So that's the two things that I had to jump back and forth. Now, the tricky part of this is 
I want to try to show the book on this page, but I don't have the information to do that yet. How do I know what book was clicked on this page? And the way we can do this is we can, you, if you look here, when book list item click, there's the item, but there's also the index and the index tells us what row was clicked. So if I go preview, the index for this one would be one, the index for, or sorry, the index for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone would be one, the index for Charlotte's Web would be two, and the index for Cat in the Hat would be three, because that's one, two, and three. So what I can do is I can use a variable. We're going to create a new variable called book ID. And remember, an app variable is available everywhere in the app. So if I say book ID and I set it to zero, since it's zero, it can't be a zero item. We're going to start with that. And then I'm also going to set this variable. So when someone clicks on the variable, I'm going to set app variable book ID to be the index of that book. So that is how we start. And now what I can do is I can actually go to show book and in show book, I can add a new function. So I want to say when show book opens. So let's go look at show book and when it opens. So when that page opens, I'm going to start to set the title. So we're going to, first of all, we're going to want to get set title text and we're going to want to set that title text to something. And that thing that we're going to want to set it to comes from the database. So we want to get the cell for that row. So what we can do is we can say book database and I want to say get cell. So now I'm going to drop get cell and we know that the column name is title and the row number in this case is the row number we set on the previous page. It's called app book ID. So I want to come over here and I want to get a variable. So I need application variable book ID. So if I jump back to the design page now and I say home, when I click on one of these things, you should see Let's start with Harry Potter. Boom, it showed Harry Potter. And if I go to Charlotte's Web, boom, Charlotte's Web. So let's, now that we know that that's working, we can go back and edit the other options here. So let's go to blocks and I'm going to say, okay, we want, I copy it and paste and I'm going to put, instead of the title, we're going to use the author. And over here, the column name is author. And let's do the same thing for year. So I'm going to copy and paste and I'm going to drop year in here. So we're going to say year. So let's take a look at our design here now. Oh, it's null, but that's because nothing has been set yet. So we have to come back and let's take a look. We say Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Boom. It shows that. Charlotte's Web. Boom. It shows that. So that is one thing we can do here. One other thing I'd like to point out, which is a little bit funny, you can see how it takes a moment to load that in. And that's because when you make a request to a database, it takes a moment for it to show. So the way we can fix this is if I go back to the editing the blocks, we can add another event handler. So when show book starts, so right away when it starts, I'm going to actually set the title text uh, or sorry, I'm going to set the title's visibility to be false. So it's not going to be visible when the page starts. And I'm going to set all three of them. So I'm going to also set author and year to be visible false when the page starts. And by doing that, it is going to hide them. But we also need to make sure we show them. So what I'm going to do is copy these all up above and we're going to make it show after the database information has been loaded. So if I copy and paste all these, you will see um, I'm going to change this to true, true, and true. 
And now what we'll see is that the preview will be uh, a little better. So when we say Harry Potter and the Stone, the text shows up right away. So that is much, much nicer. Cool. So that's part one of this problem. The second part was we wanted to be able to add a book. And the way we add a book is using a form. And I have this hidden right now, but I'm going to unhide it. So now it is visible. So now you can see that I have a new form over here. And inside that form, I have a couple things. I have three inputs. I have a title input, an author input, and a year input. And what I'm going to do here now is we're going to update the block to do something. So we're going to need to start with another event handler. And that event handler is the add book button. And when that add book button is clicked, we're going to want to add a new row. And if you look now that I say add row, it has these three little places where I can add values right away. And what are we going to do with that? We are going to look for the title input and we're going to get the title inputs text. And I'm going to copy and paste these and do the same thing, except it's going to be the author input text and it's going to be the year input text. So now when add book button gets clicked, it is going to add it to the database. Now, the one thing that's missing here is we need to reload our book list and we need to show that. And the way we're going to do this is we, we're going to read it from the database again, just like we did before. So I could actually copy and paste this down below and this will work. So let's go back to our design page and I'm going to say preview and we're going to put in the first, another book. So we're going to say love you forever by Robert Munch. And we're going to say that the year is 1986. And now when I hit add, it added my new book. And when I click, it seems to work. So that is great. Now it's a little weird that this did not change the text. So maybe after we add a book, we should actually also clear the text. So what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to say title input, set the text to be blank. And I'm going to do the same thing for author input and the same thing for year input. And all three of those have the text length. The one other thing that I think I'd like to point out here is we duplicated some code because we did the same thing twice. And we call that a code smell when you have to do the same thing over and over again. So what I'm going to do is actually create a new function and this new function is going to be called load books. And what is load books going to do? It's going to set text items to be the column title. So I pulled that out. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that function and drop it right in here. And I'm also going to drop it in down here. So instead of having to load the books again, I can delete this because it's happening in my function. So that makes the code a little bit cleaner. And if we go back and we preview our final app here, we can see we have our app and let's do love you forever again by Robert Munch. And the year is 1986. And now I'm going to hit add book and you can see it cleared the text from the bottom here. And we now have everything working. So this is great. So I'm going to jump back to the presentation here now. And I actually in the presentation have placed all the code that I used as well as the um, link to Thunkable. So you can go through and grab this link. Now I want to move on to the final topic of today. And the final topic is APIs. Um, APIs are also known as application programming interface, which is a really complicated name. But it's a special way where computers and applications can talk to each other. Oftentimes when we're building an app, the content that we need for our app already exists somewhere else. So let's say you're building an app that will allow people to decide what to wear based on the weather. You could build a big database that has the weather for every city in the world and you can update that database every day so it keeps all the weather data correct. 
But there's lots of websites already doing this, so why would you reinvent the wheel? A better solution would be to get the data from that website and show it to users through your app. And an API is what allows you to do this. Other uses for APIs can be to show a map, get information from a cloud database like Firebase, get information from social media platforms, and many more. APIs often communicate in JSON format. And JSON format of a file is where information is arranged in nodes. So let's take a look a little bit closer at this. So let's say I have this cool website and I'm selling strollers on it. And you can see that I have a price and the name and a description and lots of images for this stroller. But I don't really, as a computer, I don't need to see all this pretty formatting. All I need is the information. So what we do is we use JSON. And if you look on the bottom of the screen there, I have an example of JSON. So the first thing you see are some curly brackets there, and then it says product. So that is the first node of this piece of data. And under that product, you see that there's title, body HTML, price, and image. And then another example there is you, if you look at image, there's another node under image which actually has the source. So if we wanted to pull all this data into our own application, we would need to use this format. And I'm going to jump over to Thunkable again here now. And we have a fairly basic UX again. I have three things inside of my screen. I have the title, the description, and an image. And all of these are empty right now. And to get started, I'm going to want to add an API component. So I'm going to click here and I'm going to say Web API. And now you can see that I have a Web API. I'm going to name this the product API. So this is where I'm going to ask a website for some data. And I'm going to jump over to another tab I have open here, which is that pretty stroller that I'm selling. And you can see that we have our title, we have some price, we have the description. Um, and there's a special thing I can do on this particular website where I can put .json on the end of it. And when I put .json, it returns all the product information in this nice, neat format. And there is a bunch of other information, but the ones I want to focus on today are the title, the body HTML, and the images source. So those are the things that we saw earlier. So I'm going to jump back over to Thunkable here, and I'm going to actually pull up that uh, JSON blob we saw earlier. So you can see here we have product, title, stroller, body HTML, price, image, and source. So those are the ones I want to focus on. So we know that this URL over here is stroller.json. So I'm going to start by putting that into my API field. And the rest of this stuff I can actually leave blank because I don't need any other things here. So the next thing I'm going to do is jump over to the blocks. And we need that event handler again. So we're going to say when the screen starts, we're going to do something. And what are we going to do? We are going to call our product API and we're going to say get and we're going to get something from that product API. And this is where things get a little more complicated. And don't worry if you don't understand this right away. It will take some time. Uh, and what happens is when you make a request to that website, you get a response from it. And the response has all of that JSON data. And we're going to need to actually convert that into a way that our app can read it. So what I'm going to start with is the title. So I want to set the title text to be something from that data. But because it's in JSON format, we have to use this objects tab from the JSON blob. So here we go, I have get object from JSON and the response from my API is JSON. But the issue that I have here is the response has all of the data and we wanna dig down and just get the title. So the way that I do that is I have to dig a little deeper. So I'm going to say get 
the property of an object. And in this case, the first property name that we see in that example is product. So now that I'm inside that product node, I have to do the same thing again in order to get the title. So I'm going to say get property of an object and we have the product property here. We're going to plug that in and we're going to say get title. And now if I drop this into my code, we're going to jump over to the example again and you're going to see preview. You're going to see that, hey, the stroller information popped in. So let's go back and do the same thing for the description. So let's go back to blocks and we're going to just do a little copy and paste here. And we're going to say set the description to something. And if we look at our uh, JSON blob below, the description in this case is actually called body HTML. So we're going to get our response and we're going to drill into product. And then we're going to say body underscore HTML. And now if we go back and we give this a try again, we should hopefully see our description show up. And we go and there's the description for it. So the final thing that I want to do here is make the image show up. So let's go back into blocks again and we're going to copy and paste this. But instead, we're going to say set image picture to be something. Now, if we look at the example on the bottom of the screen, image is not as far down as we go. We actually need to go and get the source. So we need to pull this out and do one more dig. So we're going to say get property of the object image and we're going to get the source. So now we have dug all the way down here and you are going to see that we have the source set. So let's go back to our design and we are going to press preview. And now my stroller, my description and the image have all shown up in my app. So this is how APIs work. And I know these seem very complicated and you might not need to use them in your app today. But it's great to think about these things in case you want to extend your app to have additional features. So I'm going to jump back to our presentation here now. That is the Thunkable link. And that is everything I have for you today. So I just want to say thanks for taking the time to watch this video and good luck with your projects. Here are some helpful links as well in case you want to go deeper. So you can look at the Technovation Girls. Uh, Aspire Her LinkedIn is also available here and the program curriculum and the topics we covered today are 12 and 13.